accountable for the obligations that they have uh, in the annual performance report um, being that tool and instrument to measure that uh, found here on page six. And then um, the other highlight as well is that uh, the district will be uh, providing some purchase services to the school um, to include special education, um, and some other negotiations uh, that may occur during this process as well. But, um, I would like to say that uh, the Automotive Institute of Science and Technology folks who are joining us here this evening have been very cooperative, uh, very straightforward um, negotiation. Um, their legal counsel was very easy to work with on this as he has been with other contracts uh, for other charters in the past as well. And so um, we were able to get to the point where we could actually start talking about some of the pre-opening conditions and things like that and provide some um, framework for what that might look like and prepare this team for uh, the process that will be unfolding here in the next uh, year and a half. So we're excited about this and uh, we just asked that we could uh, bring this forward for an action item at the next board meeting um, and approve this with resolution. Any questions? <coughs> From what you saw, especially with this being sort of more specialized, more specific type of school, is there anything that you caught that we need to be aware of or Kind of pay attention to. No, not really. I think um, one of the things we may want to consider once we get a little bit more clarity around facilities and operations of the school and things like that is probably on insurance. But uh, beyond that, um, we've we've got pretty basic uh, property insurance and things stated in this section here. Um, and uh, at this point, I don't know that we should make any drastic changes to what we normally do, but we may find that we need to um, request some additional coverages. Okay, that was what I was saying as well as additional insurance, especially with you know hazardous materials or you know gas, oil, those sorts of things. You know how that works. That's a little more than a, a normal type of charter school. So that's why. Awesome. Thank you. They got some big ideas. So they do. And, but you know we 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 have gas and we have mechanics now already. We just not doing it in the education settings. We just need to check and see whether that twist is anything different for us. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm pretty sure our insurance company will quickly let us know what things they will cover and won't cover proactively on their own end as well. I should add final thoughts on this too as I uh, look at the waivers here. Um, the, the team did submit a uh, list of waivers that they'd like to uh, propose to the State Board of Education for approval. Um, they're fairly similar to other waivers that you have approved in the, in the past, uh, most similar to Rocky Mountain Classical Academy's waivers. Um, there is some uh, uh, congruency with the legal counsel on both both teams here, so that that makes some sense. And actually, ask that they they use that as a model. Um, we have had some pushback recently, as you know, from um, CDE on some of the waiver submissions that we've we've put through. Um, so I, I hesitate to say we won't have any pushback um, because. We probably will. So um, we're going to, uh, with your approval, we would submit these waivers um, as described in this uh, in your board packet. And then, um, if there are corrections or things that need to be changed uh, per CDE or per the state board, we'll come back with those requests at another time. Any further questions? And so are we okay with moving it over, Kevin? Yeah, I like this idea. Let's please move on. Yep. Yes. Yes. I'm thrilled to be moving that forward, and I can't wait to see it again. Thank you. Please put that on our next agenda for approval. Thank you, Mr. Franco. Thank you. We are now on to a new job description. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to that's true. That's true. There he is. <laughs> Hi, folks. I'm not Nikki Lester, Peter Hiltz, uh, Chief Education Officer. Um, with my prior approval, Nikki was unable to be here this evening to speak to this. Um, but I have I've discussed it with uh, Paul Anderson and Nikki, and I think I can answer questions about it. However, as I pulled up the packet just now, I think we're missing page two of the cover sheet. Don't last, it's after the job description. Thank you. That will make my readers more effective. Um, so, and the reason I wanted to make sure we had that line there is because on, on that uh, page of your packet, but I can't tell them I 
head. Um, you'll notice there is a budget impact. We're changing this from an administrative position uh, to to a, a higher uh, status position and a, and a higher responsibility position that actually has some uh, executive uh, function, not a, not an executive in the administrative sense of the word, but some of the reports that we submit to CTA, Colorado Technical Association, and CDE are, are pretty high profile reports and there's a significant amount of reimbursement available to us if we do it right and a significant liability if we do it wrong. Um, by significant, uh, our, our range of reimbursables for CTE has been between uh, three $350,000. It's gone as high as a million dollars. Uh, right now it's in probably the six to $700,000 range annually. And, and this position would be largely in charge of uh, submitting most of the materials for reimbursement. So uh, we, we have consensus that uh, this is a justified position. We have a budget resource to cover it and I can answer any other questions you may have. And if I remember correctly, that drop in reimbursement was because of changing rules that no longer allowed us to count some things we used to count, not because of anything else in that. So when we went from the million to 700,000, there were some things that um, the program changed the rules on what you were allowed to submit. So there were some things. Specifically, net, in, internet right. was, was disqualified. 20 years on, they decided maybe everybody should have internet and it's not a unique expense anymore. Right. So that was taken off. The so course. our folks have still done an incredible job at getting that reimbursement. I just wanted to make sure people weren't thinking that that drop was some, some that somehow owned by our employees. It's the bureaucrats changing the rules. All right. The only, thing, oh, sorry, the, only, ahead, sorry. Yeah, the only thing that caught my attention was just that difference of, of uh, salary differentiation. That, that kind of surprised me a little bit in terms of a, a five-figure number as opposed to, yeah. Maybe less than, but it just kind of threw me off guard for a little bit. If you go to the job description, you'll also notice on the on the first page of the job description, we've taken this to a full year position, two hundred and sixty one day position, and that that makes a significant difference as well. And that's partly because some of these reports have to be gathered. Uh, there is some uh, there is some requirement for alumni tracking. We have to track students after they graduate and submit federal forms based on that. And so that's why uh, we had consensus to make it a bigger and um, elevated status position. So a bigger by longer, more days out of the year. So it's a combination of being expected to work significantly more days correct. and having significantly more responsibility together that increases salary. Correct, correct. Thank you. And again, the vast majority of that should come from those specific specific funds, not from general fund. Right. Right. So that yeah. so you're submitting a larger amount to be reimbursed at the same right. time. Right. So that we get, you never get 100% reimbursement on any of that stuff at a higher percentage. You'll get a percentage of that back in the reimbursement. And is this considered uh, an administrative position that works against our ratio? No, this is a professional technical position, and I believe it is. It's range two on the professional technical chart. Um, it strikes me that we may want to just provide that chart to you as part of your standing packet because we, we often have this reference uh, to to both uh, educational support professional levels and professional technical levels, and so that's mm -hmm. something that. We can work with Don to provide that as a standing part of your, your board materials. Yes, please. And technically, this is a, a new position. That is correct. Falls under uh, the funding we get from the state for CTE? Correct. Okay. If it is a new position, we're not planning on competing that position for the best qualified person? That is correct because many of the responsibilities of this position are, are currently being done by the person in the position that we are eliminating. So we're not we're not adding a position, we're converting an existing position and if there's a person in that position, we're converting that position to a longer and, and more responsible position. And is there going to be plans a year or so from now to create an administrative assistant position when they say we need help here? Possibly, uh, because that program does keep growing. It's not only larger in number of students participating, but it's a lot more programs. Uh, this is the office that supports our, um, our office and, and the manager of workplace learning. That's also supported by this position, as well as all of our CTE programs. And as we add schools, and in particular the school that you just saw, there'll be a significant uh, relationship between this department and the Automotive Institute for Science and Technology, well, as there is for P-TECH, as there is for all of our other CTE And programs. not only for the specific CTE schools, but as we're moving to those new graduation requirements, we're gonna see 
a higher number of students at each of our coordinated high schools trying to meet graduation requirements by doing something through CTE because that would be a part of a portfolio program. So I think we're going to see this piece for those individualized pathways explode. And personally, I would rather invest the money now in the people to make sure that as it grows, it grows correctly. Um, and I think that this is an important piece of that. And, and the money is always a part of it, right? And the person is tracking to make sure we get that reimbursement. And I remember when our reimbursement um, prior to Nikki Lester heading the department was nowhere near um, the amount of money we get now. And it was largely having someone who had that expertise able to do that, um, that upped our reimbursement. But we've put a heck of a lot more on Nikki's plate since then. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be kind of unfair not to provide her the support she needs as we expand that program, in my individual opinion. So I'm good with this, but where are the rest of us? I still have questions. If you're done. So is this going to be a program manager position or project manager? Because the background information says kind of both, and I may be misreading it. It's a program manager position because CTE is a program of the portfolio. Is there a project manager in that department? There's not a, there's not anyone by that position. Okay. There are there are multiple things around the district, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. We have multiple programs around the district. For example, Health Sciences Academy at Falcon High School is a program. I get that. Those positions might be called program managers, but this isn't. This isn't. This is a district program manager. No, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that up on the program of the uh, cover sheet it says the need for a CT program manager is essential to the ongoing success. Then it says the project manager continuously addresses scope management throughout the life cycle of the CT program. So it, reading it, it leads me to believe that there's also a project manager and you're asking, but that is not the case. That is not the case. I apologize. I'm, I'm not I'm not tracking just yet, but I, I it sounds to me like that is uh, yeah, I see it. That, that's just a copy program. paste there. Yeah. Probably where it says project, it should also say program. Right. But where so, I come from, program managers require you know, certain types of certifications, education, you know, program management, professional, PFPs, things like that. Is this person you plan on hiring because you already identified someone? Correct. My concern is, is that, number one, it's a new position, but we're not competing that position. That's my concern. Okay. Number two, if, if you have already have selected someone for this position because you've identified a need for this position, but you don't identify, but you don't need it, an administrative assistant and moving one into the other position, does that person have the qualifications that we would expect from a, I would think, seasoned program manager? Because this is not a beginner. Program manager is not a beginner job. Correct. I, I'm not sure if there's a question. Is that the individual you have in mind for this position? It is qualified as a program manager. I am saying that, and, and, I'm, and I'll, I'll push it a little further. That individual is already doing largely the responsibilities described here because those responsibilities have to, to be done. Um, so we have, we have, frankly, we have been asking more of an administrative assistant position, and we're rectifying that by moving the position. We know this individual can do the job. The individual is doing the job. And I would almost brought you another concern where we, you know, is that prevalent throughout the district to have people in lower positions filling higher positions without compensation? I think it has been our practice that as the demands of a program and a position grow, we come to you and we either raise the level. So we have moved some positions tiers. So from a tier one professional technical to a tier two, we have done that when we realize that there's a discrepancy. So we're what in the military they would call a, a manning survey or staffing survey. We do that on a rolling basis. We're constantly looking at these jobs and job descriptions to make sure they match and they're fair. And if, if they're not, it, it the incumbents will tell us. And you'll take corrective action such as now. Such as now. I, I, I want to be very careful here. I don't believe this is corrective action. I believe this is an honorable response to the increased demands of a position. That's why we're doing it mid-year. We're not waiting until June to make this request. Um, part 
of what we are doing on purpose is growing CTE programming. Part of what happened when we added the position that Bob Gemignani holds, the, the manager of workplace learning, is we created more communication load, more tracking load, more um, budget accounting load. And so as we recognized that, we said, you know what, this position, and, and Nikki Lester, as, as the supervisor of this position, advocated for that, appropriately went to Paul Anderson, came to me, we worked it out and placed it where we think it belongs, and you are the final approver in that chain. In addition to that, what I'm hearing is, is that by doing this and selecting the person who is the administrative assistant, you're saying that there's no longer a need for an administrative assistant. Uh, or there is a need, uh, but we just can't afford it. I, I Actually, what we're saying is we need to work with this configuration to be able to come to a conclusion. So I, I'm not hedging. When you ask me, are we going to need this in a year? Possibly. Not certainly. Possibly. Okay, thank you. My major concern, again, is not competing the position. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, you have a qualified person, but... When you compete a position, I don't know what, you know, it would, I always thought our rules within the district were to compete uh, new positions. So if we have leeway, I, I just like whatever documentation that says what the leeway is from Mr. Anderson or, or Mr. Ridgeway to say this is what allows us to do this. That's all. I just like to see the source of that material. Okay. I know that will be the policy. Yes, sir. Does anyone else have any further questions? Or comments. Okay. Ready to move it on? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm too I am too. Let's put it on for the next meeting as well. Okay. Our next item are the um, job descriptions for child find folks. Good evening, Dr. Nancy Lamont, Executive Director of Individualized Education. I'm actually going to um, point you to the second job description, which is child find coordinator. Um, because that one kind of precedes this, uh, this job description. Um, one comes after the other. The Child Find Coordinator job description is a job description for position that we currently have but did not have a job description for. So it is, a, again, um, as we work our way through positions and uh, with employees, we are doing our best as quickly as we can to create job descriptions that are applicable for the positions. So that's what Child Find Coordinator. Um, the Child Find Coordinator, we have an obligation under IDEA for Child Find Activities, um, which means we are responsible for um, identifying students within our boundaries um, that may have a disability. Um, and that applies to children from the ages of six weeks on up through 21 years old. Um, child find, typically we work for those six weeks into preschool and then the schools take over at that point. Um, we have our baby finds that we call them, which is our six weeks to three years being done by the resource exchange. Um, because again, there's a number of those and we only have um, so many people and so much time in a day. Um, however, there is an obligation before the child turns three years old that we do another evaluation before they then enter preschool. Um, stick with me on this one. It's uh, early childhood education. It gets complicated. So what we have found is as we are identifying those babies, six weeks to three-year-olds, um, toddlers, and then they come forward and they have to have another evaluation before they hit three, we are not always completing those evaluations before three years of age. So this second position, which is identified as a child find early childhood specialist, supports the child find coordinator and supports our child find obligations of IDEA by you know, supporting those um, assessments, um, testing, observations, um, IEPs, and those things that need to be written. Along with that, um, when, those, when we have a early childhood educator or preschool teacher out of a classroom because they are ill or for other reasons, DHS imposes on us that, well, that's part of their, not imposes, but the DHS rules require that that substitute be a early childhood educator certified individual. And we can't always find those, so when available, this early childhood person would not only help with child find, but may fill in as a substitute um, within those preschool classrooms, again, when it works with child find responsibilities. How's that for everything you always want to know about preschool in a nutshell? As someone who lived through child find four times, 
I appreciate that you're taking time to kind of think through some of those responsibilities because I know for a long, long time, it was sort of a tag on responsibility for folks, which made it really, really hard for everyone involved because it is pretty intensive. It's a full-blown initial IEP evaluation for a kid who's like two and a half um, and have fun sitting through that as the parenting kid and having getting all the staff together. And I know they we used to even pull the teachers on Fridays and have them be a part of it, which meant they were losing their prep day. So I think it reduces the stress on your um, early childhood educator staff if there's folks who are responsible for that part, so the teachers who are responsible for a three to five year olds aren't necessarily having to do as much with our zero to threes. So I get it and I appreciate it as a parent who lived it. And we've had additional stress on our child find coordinator trying to meet these deadlines and stay within compliance. She's a conscientious individual and, and so um, we just would like to eliminate some of that stress. And child find is at 365. We don't get to take the time off during the summer. We are required to continue our child find activities throughout the summer. Um, so in the child find coordinator position, we kind of done um, whatever you work on over the summer, you can take off during the school year, but then that has a domino effect. If she's not working during the school year, assessments aren't being done, child find activities aren't happening. And so it just kind of became a, a little bit of a vicious circle. So we rectified that um, with this job description. The child find coordinator position will not become active until the 1920 school year. So we're going to, since we've come to an agreement on how we're going to work the days she worked this past summer, we're going to continue that. And that's her preference too. So, but then we will um, do the right thing starting in 1920. Any further questions on um, these job descriptions? Yeah, we good job. Child, child find coordinator is an existing position. Yes, we're just doing our due diligence and filling it out. Is that also covered by the Medicaid funding? Uh, no, child find coordinator is not covered by Medicaid funding. Okay, so that's that's I don't believe so, no. It, it is a district-wide activity. Okay, and, uh, and we, we have someone already filled in that position, so that's great. And the other position will be covered by Medicaid. Is it one position, the, the uh, it, it, child find an assistant? Is that one position or is it like one for each school? No, it's one position. So it's again to support the child find coordinator and then to support the preschools when time allows. That is again her, is or her, you need to be careful, there are preschool teachers that are male um, or early childhood educators. Um, his or her main role will be to support our child find activities. And that's again to make sure we remain in compliance. It is, is the word of child find, the word find, is that statutory that they use that? Or do we make that one up? Uh, it's referenced in IDEA. It's okay, referenced in, yeah. I it, just thought assessor would be more appropriate, but it just seems that that's coming from a higher order. Yeah, the child find is used through IDEA. It's also used through the Exceptional Children's Education Act, which is Colorado's law. So it's common. Not, and so child find coordinator, we have coordinators that are administrators. Um, this is similar to our SWAT coordinator. It is not an administrator. It's just common language for that role. Thank you. Uh, isn't it specific that it's our responsibility to actually to go find them? It's not just an assessor would be them coming to us. No, we have to go find them. We have Child to advertise in the paper. Yeah. We have to do a number of things yeah. to let um, uh, families know that we have this service available to them and we are obligated to provide it to them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi. Right. Well. Thank you. We're now on to the course proposal for Algebra 2. Hi, Kathy Davis. I'm a math teacher at Sand Creek High School. So we are um, wanting to propose this Honors Algebra 2 course for our school because we started an honors um, pathway um, for starting in honors geometry. And so we needed this honors algebra two course for those students to follow along into that course. So um, seeing the need for our upper level courses, and I'm uh, one of the IB math teachers as well, and, and speaking with students and knowing what they're coming from algebra two with those skills, that need is, is definitely there for them to have uh, a deeper depth of knowledge and um, just a, a rigor that 
will allow them to access not only the IB program, but to access the um, concurrent enrollment programs and um, those other types of programs. So we're looking to add this course description to that um, resume that we have at the school. And like every time we see something more rigorous come forward as an additional option, personally. <laughs> Um, other comments? Um, I just had a, a person, um, I know that Mr. and I have talked um, about it, so yeah, I know that student board will have a little more oversight when we talk more about this in the future, but I did have a question on how um, kind of the grading is going to work, um, because I see the rubric for the project, so is the project going to be worth more points than like a homework or of this assignment or like a test? Um, what's your for how um, kind of the way we're doing it in the honors um, geometry class is that the projects are more kind of like a quiz type of weighting if you want to look at it that way um, where it's an assessment of what where a student brings what they know into a project that they can display that knowledge in a different way than on a written test um, but I wouldn't say it's um, quite as heavy weighted as um, like an assessment, like a regular unit test. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. You bet. So if my dad was an Algebra two S or accelerated teacher, this fits right in line with it. It's been kind of cool to see some of the things that connect with that. So thank you. Will this honors two class affect any of the like AP classes or anything that, or, or everything that is offered will still be offered? Oh yeah, everything that's offered will still be offered. It's really just filling a gap need so that the regular um, track classes just don't provide the rigor for students that want to access those upper level advanced courses. So the AP level, the IB level, um, even concurrent enrollment level. Um, Algebra 2 is kind of your gateway class, you know, to access those upper level pathways. And so um, just seeing that you know, there's a bit of a disconnect between just a regular Algebra 2 and then jumping to those higher level classes, meeting those students starting, you know, in geometry with that rigor and then continuing it. Definitely see it as meeting students. Well, uh, not as familiar with the curriculum, but will, will there be, will this help students prepare for the SAT? Because I know some students oh, that kind of get ahead in math. Mm -hmm. You know, if they, if they don't stick with that, by the time they take the SAT, they're a year ahead and they forget what they learned the year before. Yeah, I hear you. Um, we do a lot of SAT type prep for all of our students. So we kind of build that into a lot of our math courses. Um, SAT is a lot of Algebra two. It's less heavy on geometry like ACT was. And so we're seeing that as even more, this honors algebra two will really enhance those SAT scores. It, it can't not enhance it. <laughs> great, great. Anybody else? Okay, move it forward. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for that for tonight's meeting for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item is in policy for equivalence of services for Title I. Yeah. So the note I have says that this is a newly required policy by law, but we're already in compliance with it because we were ahead of the law and we're already offering this program. Um, I'm assuming Peter can answer any questions. If anyone has any. Good evening again, Peter Holtz. Uh, I am also not Amber, um, but I am able to, to speak to this if you would like me to, if you have questions about this. Um, this is a relatively minor policy adjustment that is that is based on a change in the language of some of the expectations. Do we have policies that address the procedures that say, you know, we will establish procedures or not, not, not any additional policies. Uh, if we did, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to your question, but if we did, it would be a dash R, it would be IHBD dash R. I don't believe so because this isn't, this doesn't require very much procedural guidance. We, we simply comply with um, the submission that we're supposed to submit. Okay. Yes. 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 All right. 
So move that forward as well. Thank you. We're now on to the proposed long form vision statement. Brett Ridgeway, Chief Business Officer. At last year's annual planning summit, one of the things that we talked about and proposed that we would do this year is to, to do a long form for the vision statement. We have the best choice to learn, work, and lead. We have that up on the wall there. Those are the short forms of our vision and our mission statement. We currently already have a long form of the mission statement, but we do not have a long form of the vision statement. The reason to have a long form is, is when someone would say, what does that mean when you say the best choice? Right now, we'd answer a thousand different ways, each of us in our, in our, in our own preference, right? Our own interpretation. So uh, this uh, would be intended to just provide that next answer to say, what does it mean to be the best choice? So um, on the top here of the sheet, I have three versions, really, uh, what we started with. And again, this is Peter and Pedro and I bringing this uh, as a as fulfilling one of the to-dos we had out of last year's annual planning summit. So we started with the first one, uh, long form version one. I think I actually wrote that on a phone at the Baldridge conference in October. And uh, so uh, we, we did, uh, as we step back and look at it, uh, Peter proposed long, long form, long version two, and then I reworded a little bit of that and have long form version three, just things for us to consider. So really just looking for your thoughts, uh, whether one of these verbatim are okay, whether you'd like to wordsmith a little bit more on any of this, um, et cetera. So what about surveying? some things with our community and our staff to see what resonates with them as well because this is coming from leadership but at the same time it's something we need buy-in from everyone on um, so we thought about how we might gather some of that information or feedback and what resonates most with our stakeholders and our employees so yeah we could we could do that if that would be your preference to uh... I'm one person who thinks that would be a good idea. I, don't know I, I do answers. too. Stakeholder input is always important. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to figure out, are you going to have a, uh, a long form definition to what promoting the consensus voice of our community means? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that. Yeah, that, and that, so maybe that's the reason you don't choose that, that version, you know. Um, because we don't want to, we don't want to get this more confusing. We're supposed to add clarity, not, not, not decrease with that. I think you know, one of the things that we are trying to, as we went through our APR review, right, I think one of the feedbacks we had from that was that voice was a particular strength and unique aspect of District 49. So we wanted to incorporate that into this statement. And the, I think maybe the subtlety that I was trying to introduce in version three versus version, version two was, it's not necessarily every single voice there has to be a consensus of, that, of what that voice is and, 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 and such. So maybe that's a, a subtlety that's not necessary, you know, um, but that's what I was. I, I think the stakeholder feedback would be great. Mm -hmm. Most students, among, okay. you know, mm -hmm. employees and among the public. And I'd also be something to take to the deck as well, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. exactly. yeah, sure. Okay. Well, you never know. They may come up with a better word. You may get better words, I think. When you ask folks who are trying to live it every day too and, and spread it out personally i like respecting the voice of the community because i think respect is one of those values that we've really tried to demonstrate for a long time towards our community and respecting the voice of the community doesn't mean that you're always agreeing with every voice that's out there you respect it by hearing it right by listening and when you can address the concern addressing it but you can respectfully disagree sometimes too. So I, I don't know that we necessarily have to, and, and I think we've worked hard at respecting those who are outside of the consensus too, right? So when we have people who disagree with, with it, we engage in those conversations and sometimes then we can walk away with being able to agree to disagree, but be in a good place. So I understand where you're coming from on that on okay. the long three as well, but that personally is where I would go. Um, but then let us know whether there are certain phrases that resonate or don't resonate, or is there a different way, a different way of expressing it? You know, for some people saying performance excellence might be something that doesn't resonate with frontline staff. Is so, or maybe it does. And if it doesn't, that's giving it that's that's a little red flag that we've seen in some of our movies, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so thinking about how we word that may be important too, but we won't know that if we don't ask. 
So it could be, yeah, it could be ironic to talk about a statement of voice when we haven't asked for voice. Right, exactly. So, um, so I like that we're moving in the direction of getting a long form. Um, it sounds like we have a consensus that we would like some um, input from the greater community, including maybe some survey data on including getting their ideas of how they would phrase it or what phrases resonate or don't resonate. I think communications can figure out the best way to get some information for us. They're better at thinking through those pieces than I am. And so, um, so to maybe to, to segue a little bit, the bottom half of the document is kind of me stepping out on a limb by myself, having had a chance to really go over this with Peter and Pedro, but it was just, hey, while I'm at it, let's look at the long form of the mission statement as well. Again, me personally, the what we did initially was just take the learning, working, and leading and kind of slap it on the beginning of what was our mission statement previously that was effective, that kind of achieved the task, but still, in my mind, leaves some question on what, what does learn, work, and lead mean? And so I uh, just introduced this as a, as a idea uh, to maybe provide some additional um, clarity in that area as well. So if we're gonna seek in uh, voice, you know, this could be an opportunity to, to ask those questions as well, I think. I agree with that. I think it's a perfect opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, also, you know, find out what our mission Right. You know, means. The only caveat I might make in, in that type of survey is we're not looking to rehash the whole mission statement. That's right. We're looking to say, hey, is it the way it's worded now? Is that really serving you? Or is there is there a couple of wording tweaks that could provide greater clarity to what's really intended to be there? I agree with that. Yeah. You know, it's what does the best choice mean to you? Mm -hmm. What does to learn, work, and lead mean to you? Mm -hmm. You know, or you know, maybe you can do it either as individuals or get you know consensus. But I know Con Con will figure it out you know, what the best approach is. But I think you know this is like the next evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, to, to get this down. All right. So, so with your uh, permission, then I think what we do is is work with David and team and 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 get some of that data uh, out there and get some feedback. Maybe bring it back at the January regular meeting. See you know, with with some of that information. Um, and then we'll decide whether you know whether we need to go through additional iterations or is it something we are moving forward to for some, some formal consideration at that point. Yeah, and I like the idea of having some type of an open ended of what do those terms mean to you? Because mm -hmm. we might be surprised um, in good ways on mm -hmm. what what they mean at different levels mm -hmm. of our community because what they may mean in a central office level may be very different than what they mean at the building level because how they live each of those terms is different. Mm -hmm. It may be very different in ops than it is in the education piece. And we want to make sure that when we're doing that, we're including all of our, all components of our community um, in, in how we define it. OK. All right. So do you have enough from us for what you need? I do. All right. Thank you very much. So we are now on to the post-election information report, also with Mr. Ridgeway. Yes, so in the post-election information, we'll, we will also bring in a, uh, an item for this in December, regular meeting if we could, which is where we will kind of review the actual results of the election, do some of that precinct analysis that we've done before and such. So, because that, that data hasn't been finalized and, and released to us yet uh, from the county. So in lieu of that, or before that, what I wanted to provide is, is kind of an answer to the basic question. <clears throat> 4C passed, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what does that mean for us? You know, as much as we try to explain the possibilities, you know, in the election materials and things like that, there still, I think, would be a valid question to that. So in this presentation, this is a presentation that I've kind of designed to be able to, to deliver across the district, uh, to the MLO site, to the DAC, et cetera. You know, and so you're kind of getting the first, the first view of that. Level setting, just at the beginning, a couple of slides here as to, uh, what the size of our operation is, right? $267 million was our original adopted budget mm -hmm. this year. Everything in that includes the charter schools as well. That's what this pie chart is, is, is meaning to communicate that $81 million of that is in the charter portfolio. That is a big chunk, that's a bigger chunk by percentage and almost by dollar, but certainly by percentage than virtually any other school district in the state has. But again, just the size of the scale of what we have there. And here's the, the nice, easy to, to remember link at the website where you can find the budget. Uh, if you can type all that in. We drill down from there and say, let's, let's focus then on the operating portfolio budget. That again, portion is $185 million. As we, as we all know, the general fund is the vast majority of that. That's where most of the action happens. A lot of the other funds have a lot of rules, regulations, intentions, policies, et cetera, that govern how we're spending that money. 
And what we wanted to focus in on is what I have here labeled as other, but really is the, the consolidation of the mill levy overrides there. And so in the original adopted budget this year, we had $15.3 million showing in the lower right-hand corner of what the mill levy overrides that we can track in fund 14 and fund 16 and fund 39. It kind of gets split up into many pieces, but how that all was put together. Again, the way that we did 18.4C was to say, well, let's combine these, let's simplify, let's end up with a simple rate. Okay, that makes sense, but what does it mean, right? So first thing we need that I suggest that we need to do here is as we combine this, is to establish what is the allocation percentages because what you had in 14A, 14.3A and 16.3B, both of those had some operational components, they had some capital components. So the, the aggregation of that currently, I think most, most clear distinction we need to make is what is operational, what is capital? Even though 14.3A uh, and 16.3B all had both pieces, we don't need to break it into four, just let's consolidate that into two. Here's operational, here's capital. Our current allocation for this year is 26% was the operational, 74% was in the capital. So let's fix ourselves on a ratio moving forward that we will be able to apply to this. I like round numbers, I like easy to remember things. And so my, my suggestion there is to say, well, let's go to 75, 25, easy to remember, uh, and not a material difference from where we started out with uh, for this year. Again, okay, even if we assume that that's K, what does that mean? So let's, let's add another layer of information on there. Here would be the 1819 amended budget projection. So if we call the ballot language, part of the ballot language requirement was that we had to have a dollar amount. What does this mean for the current year or the coming year dollar amount? So the dollar amount we put on there was $16.5 million. At 18.5 mils on our new assessed value, we'll be approving the mill rates at the next meeting. We should come up with $16.5 million number. If we had that $16.5 million number and then allocated out 75.25, there would be your numbers, 4.125 million on the operational spends, uh, 4.6 million on the MLO 14 COPs and 7.775 on the 16 COPs. You'll notice that the 14 are the, is the same number. It's a 4.6 million currently, it would stay at a 4.6 million because what we have in there are instruments that are already set, they're fixed rate, they're not gonna change, those payments are gonna be static. So the opportunity, if you will, the change can come in the 16.3b what, what was the originally 16.3b COPs and of course then the operational spend. So we'd be adjusting the operational spend from 4 million to 4.1, capital spend would be going from 6.7 to 7.7 7 with that new ratio. Okay, and again, that's because the 14 share doesn't change at all. Great, what does that mean? Another one. Right? Here's what that means. So, uh, so let's talk about the, the 16.3b portions, right? We had priority two, priority three, priority four. Again, knowing that 14.3a stays the same, and it's 4.6. Priority two are for refresh and refurbish, the $20 million that we invested there. We as a community, as a, as a district invested there, that's claiming $2.5 million at the annual revenue stream. Priority three, which was the, um, the equalize all the three regular high schools, who are investing $1.1 million of the annual revenue stream in, in those instruments. And priority four, building two new elementary schools was $3.1 million. That leaves us with the next, what I live with, the next year, highlighted in green, 0.98, just under a million dollars. Under the ratio, 75 to 5 ratio is available for capital. This is again, part of the design of what we can do going forward, where we can, as our community grows, we can go with, grow with the community and those collections will grow. So just like the operational game will continue to grow, this will grow and it will create a bucket here of additional funds available that we'll be able to then take action on. So just think about it. What does that mean? If I add on the 1920 and the 2021 projections here, as our assessed value continues to grow, that strip will continue to grow. And we'll be able to then say, well, in 1920, well, it, that'll be 1.7 million. And in 2021, that could be 2.3 million. I believe that these are conservative numbers, actually. Priority four, recall, again, that's building two new elementary schools for $3.2 million a year. Okay, so exactly. 
in 1920 is when we could perhaps first have our first you know, consideration of, hey, do we want to build a new building, another new building? So is that cumulative when I look at that green line and I look at the 1920 project, is that 1.7 million in addition to the 0.98 million from the prior year? No. Or is that including it? That includes the 0.98 from the prior year. Okay. So that 0.98 from the prior year could actually could be a one-time bucket. Right. Potentially. And in the next year, that 98 grows to the 1.75. And if we don't do anything with that, that could be a one-time bucket. And the next year will go to 2.3 million. Okay, so as we're growing, then we can consider with our middle of the over, oversight committees, with our long range strategic, you know, long range planning committee that, that uh, Pedro is uh, reconstituting, what will be that next step we want to take? Is it in another elementary school? Is it another middle school? I would say if it's another middle school, if it's a middle school, that may be something we want to take back to the voters and say, well, in the past you had said we could build elementary schools with this money. Would you let us build a middle school too? So, without raising taxes, without raising right? Tax. Just using the revenue streams that we've already established. So that's what this pattern now should establish for it. And, and I've modeled it out for the next 30 years, honestly, and we can get in a routine of building a building, potentially, if we all we do is elementaries, we could probably build, end up building a building every three to four years and handle our growth. Will that handle all of our growth? No, it'll handle a, a, a big part of it though, probably a majority of it. But the only thing we could fit into this is a high school. High schools are so big. You know, that's an $80 million project right now. It'll quickly become a $100 million project. That's kind of that's kind of bigger than this. But in terms of elementary schools, I would think we should be able to handle pretty much all of our elementary school growth, if not literally all of our elementary school growth in the future, and potentially some of the middle school growth. We'll have to see how we grow, how assessed values grow, things like that. But that's the way this structure should, should operate as we move down the line here. Well, because that's not even, your numbers here aren't even taking into account all the new building occurring, right? Uh, no, it is. Is it? It is. Yeah, that's that's how that's how this would be growing, uh, would be the change in assessed value. So it's not only the appreciation of, of property that we are that already exists, but it is the additional that gets that gets added. And remember, it's every two years that that full cycle gets refreshed, a full revaluation. If you didn't have that this year, this was the update, the off year update. Next August will be the full update of assessed values in the district, and that's where I was saying I think this one seven five could actually be conservative. Because the growth, it only, I think I've only modeled in like 5% growth, maybe 6% growth. I'd be very surprised if, if we get to next August and we've only grown 5 or 6% in terms of assessed value in the district. So, but that will be our next milestone, our key milestone. We can spend between now, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, in the annual planning summit, again, the long range planning, we'll, we'll be trying to starting to scope out ideas and options. But it's when we hit that milestone in August and we're able to then do the math and say, here's what the opportunity can, can be, here's what's feasible, here's what's not yet feasible, and we can start having those conversations. What do you think about, as we kind of go through this, trying to codify it a bit in policy to ensure that there's an obligation to honor the intent forward, right? Mm -hmm. So like the five of us all get it because we were here as a part of the process. Mm -hmm. Ten years from now, people sitting here may not get it because they didn't go through this with our community and you're putting a lot of thought and intent behind making sure that we honor the intent mm -hmm. of our voters and policies can change so policy doesn't lock us into never being able to adjust mm -hmm. to an exigent circumstance but it would be an additional commitment to our community that we could be very visible about this is how your funds were divided based on how you voted. So by policy, we want to set up, we set up something that honors that and respects it and explains it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then our community can hold us accountable to that, right? Because then if we want to do something different than the policy, we have to say, okay, we want to change the policy or we want to set aside the policy that takes board action in public. Um, it may add an additional layer of respect and protection mm -hmm. as one person, but it, um, again, policy is always nice for guidance as right. we think about how the organization lives beyond all of us. Exactly. That's that's exactly kind of where I was hoping to take this. And, and really the kind of the first step in, in writing that policy would be this allocation ratio, right? And so getting that guidance to say, okay, here here's how we interpreted that, and that's why we're going to set it in the policy, and that's how we will write the rest of the policy, basically, making that initial assumption, key assumption to it. Because you could even have that next column become a you know, a separate 
budget. We used to have a capital, I don't know if we still do the capital reserve account back in the day. Yeah. You set something up like that again where it's okay, this is our capital or capital project savings account or something. I don't know how you title it appropriately as an accountant, but something that indicates what um, how where we're allocating that and then our community this so that it's very transparent to our community where that fund sits and what its intent is. Mm -hmm. Because of course in a budget this big People will always say we're fudging it unless we can prove we're not by showing, look, nope, money went right there, and this money now is used for this, and that direct tracking, I think, helps keep that transparency and respect. So I'm really happy that you're going down these lines and thinking through it. Cool. I'm for that, setting a policy, because you would need one that says 75, 25, and then yeah. you would need one that says this is what this is for, that's for. Mm -hmm. So that is more consistent with how we've been doing this. Mm -hmm. What this also does is gives our, because of our voters, it's also given us as a district to be able to not come to them later on and say, oh, hey, we need to increase taxes more for a capital project or to do that. This is sort of saying, we're, because of what we did here in 2018, we're giving us options that leads us into the future to say, when we ask you, if we ask you for more funding, it's going to come in a, a more responsible form because of what we have done leading up to it. Right. Uh, yeah, that was some, and some of the presentations I was making during the campaign season, I was, I was, I believe pretty consistent on this doesn't mean we won't ask for more again but this means that it delays delays that and makes it less frequent that we'd have to be coming to ask because again like i said the one thing that's clear out of, out of this that we can't handle is a high school issue middle school that could go either way honestly it just depends um, but yeah this, if there's a lot of opportunity uh for our community to, to be proud in what they've established here uh, but we also need to help make sure that they understand what they've established here through this I'm sure you'll have a communications or a web page where they can go to to see the simplified version of what 4C means to the district. Exactly. We already have the ML Mill Ride right web pages on there. We'll just need to you know, retool those a little bit and add some of that good context. Just then advertise it. If you want to know more about what 4C means, you can go here. Mm -hmm. I probably also encourage us to be mindful that those numbers, the, for instance, the uh, 0.98 to the 1.725, the 2.325, 2 are not guarantees. Those are not, you know, locked in numbers that that's no. absolutely what it's going to be. It could go up or down. Right. In that way, those are just projections right. that you've provided us. No. All right. So do you need anything else from us on this right now? No. So I appreciate that guidance. I will, I will start working on some, some policy language. Like I said, I'm also going to definitely present this to the General Oversight Committee next Tuesday. Um, try and get on the DAC agenda and just kind of get some of those early temperature checks and make sure that they're also seeing this and hearing this clearly and they're okay with that that intention for us to go forward um, okay. and then eventually bring bring some policy drafts back to you for that. Perfect. So did anybody else have any further comment or question before we move forward? So you've got your direction? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. We're now on to policy procedure review. Did anyone, these are the standard ones, did anybody have any questions on any of the policies in number seven? Down there? All right. So now we are. So we'll move those all forward because nobody's bringing up a question. We're on to the monthly financial update with Ms. Poole. Bring that way down here. <laughs> Hello. How are you, Jody Pullen, County Group Manager? Um, so um, I promised last month that I would continually build on this um, because of our new software and um, the reports that we're able to get out of it. Um, so um, yes, I think it doubled, maybe tripled from what it was last month. Um, good thing, good news is, is that everything that I have in here, I, I have broken down a little bit of everything from every fund so we can kind of see a high level. Um, but general fund, I really focused on um, to, to give us a breakdown um, by zone, by school. Um, at the point in the year, as at the end of October, I'm sure, sorry, that should say October 31st, not 30th, um, we should be about 33.3% of budget. Um, I believe overall we're right there. Um, individually, there may be a school that is a percent high, percent low, um, but overall. Obviously, it, it does come down to that 33%. Um, I don't have anything specific other than, um, oops, I, by that. Um, I did want to give you another update because I kind of like um, seeing that 
um, how many checks and EFTs we're doing as of last week. So from July through last week, um, we've produced 616 EFTs for roughly $14,500,000. We've produced 17, 1,717 checks for just under $20 million. Um, so that's a lot of money going out our door. A lot of people um, working really hard to get all that information, working with the new software, learning things every day. Um, and so next month, um, hopefully I can take these where I'm giving you a high level and dig in a little bit deeper, um, giving more, more information, um, just different more levels of that information for you. Does anybody have any specific questions on anything? Or questions for Jeremy? In the word packet you had, you had because I know your, your love for spreadsheets um, and small numbers are not numbers. As well, just and that's a good step for us to be able to get to to say, hey, we're now able to start producing that type of detailed information out of the new system uh, as well. So you can look forward to, to those features. <laughs> Thank you. I must say, and I don't know if I say this enough, but I really love the way that this report has evolved since the first meeting I was in three years ago. Thank you. It's getting better. Okay, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're at the student count and amended budget update. Mr. Sprins. Good evening, board. Uh, Ron Sprins, uh, Director of Finance. Um, probably, I don't know if you noticed or not, but this was an 11th hour update uh, that I was able to get to Donna on uh, Monday. Um, <clears throat> uh, due to some personal time off and um, the Thanksgiving holiday, um, haven't done a ton of work on the amended budget, but at the last meeting, we did discuss the October count and some of the potential issues that we're, we're seeing. So that has been finalized. Uh, I shouldn't say final, final. It's in, we're going with final now. I think it's about 99%. I think there's still a couple of duplicate issues, uh, duplicate student issues, and that's where um, we're, we're, we're saying we have a student and another district is saying they have the same student and so there's a, a process that they go through to determine where that student goes to. And from what I understand, there was a fairly sizable list and we've been uh, uh, on the positive side of a lot of those those issues. So that's uh, been good for us. But still, uh, again, I tried to lay the bad news uh, at the last meeting and you can um, see here up in the red, I've, I've layered in the October count as it sits uh, to, uh, today, um, down 191 students from where we budgeted. Now, uh, I have the, the number, it's, it's escaping me right now. We're, we are over last year by 150. Yeah, 150 but, it's about the same. Yeah, about 150 over, over last year. So we are a growing district, one of the few in, in, the, in our El Paso area that, that is growing. Um, just again, not we're just not to to our budget to where we were hoping we'd get to. So uh, you can see the differences at each of the at each of the the, the zones, um, and then um, based on their initial uh, normalization amounts, um, I've multiplied that out to show a potential um, risk to the to the to the zones, uh, where we'll work with them to um, figure out how we're going to. Uh, get through the through the year with these uh, negative numbers. Um, something we've done in the past, something we're good at. Um, the, the zone leaders are, are really good at, at, at making the necessary adjustments and um, we'll have that plan going forward. That's all I really have. Um, I hope to have a little uh, much more clearer picture at the December meeting and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Any questions? Questions, anyone? No, but I want to say thanks for I mean, 191 students, that's about 13, you know, 12,815. That's a very narrow window of gap and percentage to be dealing with. I'm aware of other districts that are struggling with larger numbers than what we are in terms Absolutely. of. Absolutely. And so it's a, it's great to know that we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Thanks to our zone leaders for, you know, kind of looking into being a little bit difficult, but making it as smooth as possible. Yeah. We'll continue to work to get that uh, tighter process 
And the important thing to remember is we're really not down students. We did just didn't grow quite as much as we projected we would grow. So in fact, our budget and our number of students is still larger than last year's. That's right. Um, which is what many of our um, neighbor districts cannot say. So their, their negative adjustments are true negative adjustments. Ours were, oh, we don't need quite as much as we thought we might have to grow into, which is a nicer position to be in, I think. So I thank our staff for working on that. It just looks different because of the way we have to sit it on the budget. And this doesn't include charter schools. That's correct. This is an operated portfolio. All right. If there's no further questions, we'll say thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. And we're on to our monthly chief officer reports. I won't, uh, I won't add anything to the written report other than to tell you that we have been uh, following up on the VOW annual survey with our VOW learning tour process. We've mentioned that to you previously. Uh, we have three today, actually. Um, so we're a little over, yeah, a little over two-thirds of the way through a meeting with every school, every department, and we're, when we meet with those schools and departments, we're meeting with a representative um, group that, that not only includes all of our workforce segments, but it also includes a, a range of functions. And so, for example, today, uh, while we were meeting with a group from the school, we had uh, a school nurse, we had a healthcare professional, we had an ELD paraprofessional, a security person, um, we had a couple of teachers, uh, we had a building manager, and we just get a great cross-sectional perspective by having those conversations. They're going really well. We're capturing all of our notes, and then when we finish our tour, we'll sit down and compare notes and debrief and consolidate that back into some reporting to you. In the business office report, uh, you know, we're in, we've been in the open enrollment season, so I provide you some of the stuff that Shannon has been working really hard at, including the full, what she calls the bag. I don't know that it's a great acronym that way, benefits at a glance, but it's, it's, this is what the employees receive in terms of helping them make these decisions. Um, and so, and then you also saw the full meeting schedule. So there were meetings all over the place happening that she was going to providing the great service, which is why benefits rank so well for us consistently on the ballot survey. But I wanted you to have an opportunity to see some of that uh, firsthand. The TQAM, our IT, uh, our IT lead, is focusing on assessing uh, networks across the district of folks in particular at uh, a couple of our high schools. So we're, lo we're looking really hard at uh, where we are with our networks and, and some of the areas where we can identify more improvement across the board. So that's getting quite a bit of this focus. I wanted to highlight that, and the only, only piece I wanted to highlight was uh, Santa Express is this Saturday with the Transportation Department, our annual uh, effort that the volunteers within the Transportation Department lead to providing uh, providing toys and gifts for some of the uh, some of the more underprivileged uh, uh, students that we have in the district. So, great effort, uh, and it's uh, it's absolutely phenomenal to see that every single year. And that will take place again this Saturday. So, we look for something to do on Saturday morning. Come and see Santa roll up on the fire truck over here. My daughter will kill me if I go because Falcons JROTC is working the event, and Mom is not allowed to appear in her professional capacity anywhere my daughter is Let's under go. pain of death. So, um, but I love that event. Did the Falcon DROTC serves breakfast to everyone every year. So, Let's go. Our calendar. in a minute, my child. All right, does anybody else have anything further? Peter, thank you for the uh, concise uh, executive summary. Uh, the few things that really interest me, I was able to move around in your report and find especially the restorative practices and the Falcon, uh, the power zone stuff that they were doing. So I greatly appreciate when you guys do the executive summaries. Anybody else have anything further? And we are done.